Okay, thank you. So, uh, so today, as announced, uh, is the new formulation of uh, the Teichmuller TQT. And so, all that I say in the first lecture is uh, joint with uh, Renat Kashayev. And so, if you uh, want some archive numbers, well, the first one was really 11096295. And then there was the new formulation, which is 13054291. And then we have a, a further paper that kind of compares the two, or at least starts the, starts the discussion of comparing the two, which is this one. And then there is another one which is joined between me and a former postdoc, Jens Christian Kratman Nissen. Uh, Jens Jakob, sorry, Kratman Nissen. 982. So this is with uh, Kratman Nissen. Okay, so uh, it's me. This is calling you, yeah. So what say? This is calling you. <laughs> so th this one is new. <laughs> Ten years ago. Eh? Ten years ago. So uh, we. Sh I don't know whether the, it was a very good formulation we chose, you know, because new would become old, right? The main player of this game is triangulations. So here's a tetrahedron. Okay. And so what I will do is that I will choose orderings of the vertices. And there's really two orderings up to symmetry, namely these two here, uh, um, three, two, one. Did I do this correctly? Let me do, sorry. <laughs> I want to make sure I didn't cyclically permute them. So these two here are the two different ones that there are. It's a plus and a minus. So we call this one plus and this one minus. And so to avoid making a lot of drawings of these tetrahedra and arrows between the faces when I identify, I'm going to use the following symbol. So they're both going to be like this. The four things that are sticking out of the baseline is uh, uh, the four faces, okay? And I always have them ordered from left to right. And uh, in order to distinguish the two different ones, the first one, is so, so I simply just put orientations on the edges. So this is, and they always go in, out, in, uh, sorry. Uh, in, out, in, out. And this one here is opposite, so this one goes out, in, out, in. So those are the two different ones that are possible, t plus and t minus. And now, what I allow, so maybe I just say it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at triangle, let me write this one, at least the title, triangulated. There. Triangulated pseudo three manifolds. And we call them pseudo three manifolds because the vertices may not be smooth points. Okay, so I've allowed some gluings such that the vertices, the neighborhood is not a small ball. Okay? So what what are what I'll just say it in word, what are triangulated pseudo three manifolds? Well, they are finite collections of positive and negative tetrahedra glued along the faces with orientation preserving, sorry, orientation reversing, but order preserving maps. Okay, and so there are sort of canonical affine maps once I've said this, uh, that glues the two together along a face. And then you keep gluing like this. So uh, let's do a couple of examples, maybe. So, uh, yeah, first of all, before I do that, what I want to do is that if x is such a guy, I'm going to denote delta ni 
of x. This is the uh, i simplices. Uh, in X. So I mean, each tetrahedron comes with uh, three simplex and four faces and six edges and four vertices, right? But they drop down and be densified with each other in various patterns in X. And so this is the ones that are down in X yeah. after identification. Again, uh, you understand that it's not just the three manifolds are not those when you have just uh, what is called. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Tori is a bundle. Not necessarily. I mean, no, you could have higher genus as bundle. No, no, but for for the vertex, uh, for for the hyperbolic geometry, it's the most natural class. The most know. natural class will be, say, the ones with one vertex, and the tubular neighborhood has a boundary which is a torus. Torus. So it's a solid or torus. Several, or if several. you want more components, then several of those. Several tori. Yeah. yeah. So I, I will give you now examples exactly of this. So suppose we have this diagram here like this, and if I go like that, so this one here, so I glue uh, T1 plus with T2 plus. So two tetrahedra are glued together, the faces are glued according to this, and so the numbering of the faces is always opposite, right? So this, this down here is phase zero, phase one is this, phase three is this, and phase two is the one at the, at the bottom here, right? So the number opposite gives you the face. Okay, so, so what happens here? Let me just go through it in detail. The delta three of X, well, of course, there are two tetrahedra, T1 plus and T2 plus. Okay, and now, of course, there are faces, and there are four faces because they get paired up in, in, in pairs. So, I mean, this is just F0, F1, F2 and F3. These are just the pairs of the faces that have got glued to faces. So there are four faces, of course. And now if you chase around and check, I claim that delta one of X has two edges, E0 and E1. Okay, and so... What's the correspondence between tetrahedra and the interval? So that it's right here. <coughs> So, so I, the direction is, so you can only glue in to out, and this is a positive tetrahedron, and this is a negative tetrahedron. Okay. Mm. And the edges between tell you how to glue the faces. And then from there, everything else follows by my rules that it has to be ordering, preserving, and orientation reversing. Okay, and so, you know, in, in this case here, there are 12 edges before I glue, and after gluing, there's only two, I claim. And uh, if you look at the zero cells of X, well, this is, there is a single vertex in this case here. And if you look at the tubular neighborhood of the vertex, so N of V is a tubular neighborhood of the vertex, and I take a boundary of that, this is a T2 in this case here. And so I claim that this manifold here, if I remove the vertex, so X, X minus V, this is S3 minus trefoil. So that's this example here. So, I mean, you can chase through uh, I don't want to write up all the edges and how they go, all right? But uh, let me just do a further example, because these are nice and nifty. Let's now do this one here. So this one, so T1 is plus, and now the other one has to be minus because I switched all of these. So if I go like this, then I have to go like that, then I have to go like this, and then I have to go like that. And then you can discover this is a minus. I decided what this guy was, so that's a plus, this becomes a minus. And so in this case here, so if X is this guy here, well, this guy here, of course, constantly, I mean, the number of tetrahedra don't change in the gluing process, right? So 
there like this. But then, uh, and, and the number of faces, I don't want to repeat that. That's, of course, just a pair up, right? The more interesting thing is what happens to the one cells? And there's again two edges in this case. And there is again only one uh, zero cell. And again, uh, if you look at the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of this guy, it's a two torus. And in fact, this guy here is S3. So, sorry, if you take X, which is a singular point of this space, right, just as before, and you remove it, and this is S3 minus 4, 1. Okay. Let me just not uh, spell out all the edges, maybe, or maybe I should list uh, one. So, so, so let me do one more. Uh, that is, it has three tetrahedra, and I do like this. Um, like that. So it has T1 plus, T2 plus, and T3 plus. So three plus tetrahedra, when you do it like this, then you can fill in all the ones, right? It has to be alternating at each of the baselines. Okay. Now, the, the interesting thing about this example is that it, or interesting, I mean, it, it has uh, three edges as opposed to the two edges we saw before in the two previous examples, still has only one vertex. So they all get identified to one vertex. And if I take X minus V, this is S3 minus 5, 2. And uh, if you want, uh, this is 6, 1. And, uh, and over here is uh, 6, 2. With 5 tetrahedra. Okay. Yeah, let, let's stop this example business uh, for now. But it's, it's really uh, very nice and easy to generate examples and work with them this way. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce a shape structure. So say a shape structure is simply the following. You take a tetrahedron and then what you do is you assign dihedral angles to opposite edges. So you assign maybe alpha to this one, and then you're obliged to assign the same one to the opposite edge. There are three pairs of opposite edges, right? And so, for example, this one here I might call beta. And then this is also beta. And then this one here I might call gamma. And this is gamma. Okay. So what I want, and these guys are going to be real to begin with. So, sorry. They're all real. And uh, I want that they are the sum to pi. And sometimes I might actually ask that they are positive. But I might also just ask that they are complex. And I will use all of them as we go along. Okay. And so you might be, so, so I mean, it's, this is the usual guy like this. And so you might be, be more used to the, the complex modulus of a hyperbolic tetrahedron. And so if they're all positive and they sum to pi, then uh, if you look at sine of beta divided by sine of gamma, times e to the i alpha, then this is the usual complex shape variable. Of an ideal hyperbolic tetrahedron. So you throw 0, 1, and 2 at 0, 1 at infinity, and then 3 will be some point in the complex plane if it's an ideal hyperbolic tetrahedron. And it's given via the angles by this formula here. Okay. 
All right, so now you can imagine what a shape structure on X is. It simply just means that for all of the tetrahedra in X, you assign shapes to all the tetrahedra. Okay, so we will be working with things that have shape structures. All right. Good. So now, if I have a shape structure, what I can do is I can define the following map, omega x from delta 1 of x to r plus. So now I'm working with the situation where they're all positive, but if we're in the same, you just replace r plus with r and, and see if you decide otherwise. And so omega x of a given edge well, a given edge in X has, you know, all its pre-images in the disjoint union of the tetrahedra. And now I just sum all of the angles that I see upstairs in the so corresponding tetrahedra in those edges. So it's the total angle around an edge downstairs in X. So this is the sum of angles around the edge in X. Okay, good. So now, then there's a little definition here. So an angle structure is, uh, is, 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 a, is a shape structure Shape structure on X, so this is an angle structure on X, uh, such that omega X of E is 2 pi for all E in delta 1 of X. Okay, and so there is a little Euler characteristic computation that you can do that you will see that uh, by the way, we call it that an edge is balanced if the sum is 2 pi. So this is the balanced condition. So I might use this word several times. Balanced. Can you see it? So that it sums to 2 pi means that it's balanced. And so you may not be able to balance all edges. Okay, so for example, if it's a closed 3-manifold and, uh, and you just take a and it's, it's completely smooth, so then it's a sphere, and there's a little Euler characteristic argument that will tell you there, then there you cannot balance all the edges. But if it's a torus boundary, it is absolutely no problem. And if there are several tori boundaries, there are no problem of balancing all the edges. Okay. Very good. But, of course, there might still be problems of assigning positive angles to all of them in such a way that you balance all of them. If I release the condition and go to R, there's absolutely no problem for the, one, for the ones which had torus boundaries. And same for C. Okay, so, uh, yeah. So, so now I want to introduce a, a little notation. This thing here, inside C is going to be the unit circle. Okay. So it's just uh, in order to remove uh, the little up one, I put the one inside instead. So what, I, what we're going to do now is we're going to build a TQFT. So build a TQFT. And so uh, this is this Teichmuller, this, this this new formulation. Dimension. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> well, there are there are you know yeah okay, new um, new T new T Teichmuller TQFT. Okay, and the whole idea is the following: that this partition function of this TQFT, so I'm going to put a little twiddle here because it's not going to be the final word on this. But 
this guy applied to x uh, and it also depends on the angle structure. And so I'm just going to call that A abstractly for angle structure. Is it F or is it? This one is F. So we are going to try to do it the following way. We are going to take the unit circle to delta 1 of x, and then we are going to define some smooth function, some density, which depends on uh, x and a, and then we are going to integrate respect to mu, and mu is the translation invariant measure on s1 to the delta 1 of x with unit volume. Bar measure, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Everything, of course, will boil down to how do we define this function. Okay. So let me now start defining this function. And so the function will depend on all the angles. Okay. And so you can sort of ask the question, you should think about the question that, well, I have all of these tetrahedra and I have all of these angles assigned to the tetrahedra. So in particular, the number of variables that there are in the A's here will depend on the number of, of tetrahedra, right? So I have to work in order to try to describe for you what does it mean that this is an invariant of X? Because right now I'm going to define something that is a function that depends on the number of tetrahedra. And the number of tetrahedra is not a topological invariant of the triangulation, right? So, but I'll, I'll return to this. So right now I will just start constructing this function. And so uh, let me just write down the following explicit map. So this map E, it's a map from the space where I want the function to live. So this space here, you, you're okay with the notation, right? This here means all possible maps from this set into that. So it's a torus just indexed where the coordinates are indexed by the, by the edges, right? Okay. So this here is going to be a map like this. Okay, so it's a map from the uh, assignment of variables to the edges to two variables on each tetrahedron. Okay, this says delta 3 of x cross. I mean, I don't know why I wrote cross. Maybe the cross here, but let's forget it, right? So, uh, yeah, so two big two dimensions here. <laughs> you know, uh, this is a two torus. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. okay, so what is this? Well, here's 0, 1, 2, 3, and of course I'm going to use the following notation. The variable on that edge is 0, 1, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define this map on all the tetrahedra, and then it's just a matter of, you know, you assign variables to the edges downstairs. That will give you variable assignments on all the edges before gluing, and now you just to repeat this map for each of the tetrahedra. But so I just give you the map for one tetrahedron. This is x12. I mean, I think you can repeat the pattern here. So E of x01, x02, x03, x12, x13, x23 is the following very explicit map. And so in the paper from 18, we explain how this map came about, because right now it looks very mysterious. But so you do x02 plus x13 minus x03 uh, minus x12, and you, you should think of this as written in logarithmic coordinates. So I also always think about logarithmic coordinates when I'm specifying this, okay? So coordinates in, in R instead of in the circle. It's a billion group. So therefore, you could also think about it this way. Yes. 0, 2 plus x1, 3 minus x0, 1 minus x2, 3. So that's the explicit map. Good. All right. So, uh, so if we, let's see if I still have it. Oh. Uh, 
I, did I already rub? No, it's up there, yeah. So, um, yeah? Just two cross ratios. What? It's just two cross ratios. Yeah. Logarithmic. Logarithmic. Okay, so now no eraser. Oh, oh, it's in the cleaning location. But actually, uh, I want to keep this. <coughs> So, um, so what, I, what I'm now going to do, so let me just write this over here, is that uh, I'm now going to select the function which depends on the sign of the tetrahedron, it depends on h bar, and it depends on the two parameters there is in the angle structure. And so this guy here turns out to be a smooth section of a line bundle over this two torus. But you, so you can just think of it in logarithmic coordinates as a function of two variables, which is quasi-periodic in those two variables. And so I'm going to give you this G now. <laughs> but first, let me just, so, so what I now do, of course, is that I just take this G and evaluate it on these two. I take the product of all tetrahedra, and then I, that's my D. So, so D. So I haven't told you what L is, and I'll tell you what L is a little later. Yeah, yeah. So D, H, X, A is simply just a product over the tetrahedra, so T in, uh, in delta 3 of X, and then I have G of the sine of T, and I have H bar, and then I have alpha of T comma gamma of T. So it's just this function here. This E is kind of some change of variable here. Yeah, this is just this change of variables that you compose this with. So then it becomes a function of all the edges. The right. number of undefined symbols is increasing. <laughs> no, G is undefined. No. G, G, G. G is undefined so far. E is defined. G is missing. E e epsilon. Yeah, that is true. Can you guess what epsilon is of a tetrahedron? Sine. Sine. Very good. Right? There are two. So epsilon of T is the sine of the tetrahedron. Good. OK. So let me do an example. So for four one, what I see is that I should have two variables, right? Because I have one, I have two edges. So there should be two variables. And you can just let me just start writing, but uh, but I don't want to do all of them. But it turns out that so if you call the variables of tetrahedron one for up one. Some, Some questions. Some questions. Some Some questions. Questions. Which cancel all, all the things. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So uh, I'm just saying that if you look at the variables, then I have variables with up, up index one for tetrahedra one, up index two for tetrahedra two, and so I have two variables. I call them x zero and x one, matching these two edges here, e zero and e one. So I'm doing this example of four one right now. And so this one here, I can just start doing it. You can complete it. But so you see, actually, this is all of them now for this one. And x1 becomes identified with x1, 2, 3, x2, 1, 3, and so on. So. All of these 12 different variables that I have on the two tetrahedral before I glue gets identified to either x0 or x1 in this case. And so, therefore, my function x here, well, it's a comma a, 
of x0 comma x1, well, it turns out to be g plus h bar alpha 0, 1, 1, comma alpha 0, 3, 1. So it's also convenient sometimes to simply call them all alphas and of course to note them the same way as the variables are because they live on edges. So it is this one here. And let me just spare you the long computation, just give you the answer. So it gives you the following expression when you compute it out, times g uh, minus uh, h bar alpha 0, 1, 2, alpha uh, 0, 3, 2, and then x1 minus x0, comma 2, x1 minus x0. So just like this one here, minus that. Okay, so that's the function in this case here. So it's totally trivial. You can immediately write it down for the trefoil and of, uh, this was the trefoil, sorry. Uh, no, this is for one. You can write it down for whatever you want, right? Okay. Sorry, what is alpha zero one? It's a, the alpha is It's an angle. Yeah, so, so, so I, before I called them alpha, beta, gamma, but I can also denote, uh, they are, they are here, and so the more natural thing to do, of course, is to call this one alpha zero one, alpha one two, alpha two three, and so on. And then, of course, they get an upper index from the tetrahedron they belong to. But you, you know, where is h bar anywhere except it's, it's in g. It's in g. Yeah, but g, g is not written yet. G is not written yet. G will be the hero of the day. He appears later. <laughs> 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 He's introduced and uh, wanted, and so now let's get him. And you have only, only two angles appearing. Yeah. Uh, Which ones? So, um, so, so the thing is that they sum to pi, uh -huh. and so the way that this is done is that for a tetrahedron, it depends only on alpha gamma, but of course I can deduce beta from those two by this algebraic equation. Right? <laughs> So beta is a pi minus the sum of the two. Ah, so G is okay, yeah. yeah. It's kind of secret, it's three variables for... Three it's secretly three variables, but I chose uh, alpha and gamma. Yeah, okay, first and last. Okay, so uh, that was this example. And uh, let me just uh, move this over here. And so um, now, where do we get this function from? So we need a function of two, var I mean, two variables, which is quasi-periodic. And, uh, and depending on three parameters, h bar, alpha, and gamma. OK. So, and for that, I will need the, the vial Gelfand uh, stack transform. So we gave it this name because all three considered this transform, as far as I can tell, independently. So uh, SAC in particular used it for signal processing. And so this transformation is an isometry from the Schwartz class of functions on the real line. So these are functions which decay faster than any polynomial, one over any polynomial at infinity. And so it's an isomorphism on tool C infinity, C2, L. And so now I better give you what L is. So L is explicitly R2 plus C modulo a specific lattice. And so the, well, sorry, modulo the standard lattice, but the specific action is the following. So n comma m, which are integers, acts on this triple here by, it shifts in the variables and then it multiplies by some quantity in the last variable, right? So n m e to the pi i uh, n x minus m y. So this is the quasi-periodicity factor that I want to build into this, or that this guy has. And so what is the expression for this? So we almost saw this uh, transform in uh, Iwaki's talk. He called it the uh, discrete Fourier transform, 
And so modulo the following prefactor, it's the same. So you shift the argument of the function by m, and you take the corresponding phase. So this one here. But because one has this prefactor here, it actually exactly matches with these quasi-multiplicity rules here. So it becomes a section of this bundle. OK, it's a really nice transform. It extends to uh, the dual also. So uh, it's continuous and therefore extends to the dual. So it also works from a temperate distribution onto distributional sections. And uh, it's also, if you take L2 completion, you can complete this to L2. And then it's L2 sections with the standard uh, inner product on this line bundle and the standard invariant measure. And it's an isometry of Hilbert spaces. So it's a beautiful transform. OK, and so now, now let me give you uh, the expression. So let me see here. Right. So G plus of H bar alpha comma gamma is the Weil-Gelfand transform applied to a specific function. Uh, sorry. Like this. And that depends on, of course, the same variables. Okay. And what is this function? And so uh, let me write it out explicitly for you. So do, 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 do. let me actually start all the way over here. So h bar alpha gamma of s. This is e to the i pi over 12 e to the minus pi i s squared phi b of, and so this is like this, phi b of minus s plus 2 c b of alpha plus gamma. So I owe you what phi b is and I owe you what c b is so far. Uh, e to the four, 4 pi, 4 pi i c b squared, and then it's alpha times alpha plus gamma. Uh, e to the minus 4 pi i c b alpha minus s plus 2 c b alpha plus gamma. And then the last one is uh, an overall scale as well, pi i over 6 c b squared and then 4 alpha minus gamma uh, plus 1. And so what is c b? Uh, is for the dialog, yeah, phi, phi b is for the f dialog. So, so let me write. Uh, so let me push this one up and and write the remaining guys. <clears throat> okay, so. First of all, phi b, and I try to make sort of a bold, bold b like this, this probably fail after a while, of x. This is the usual for the AF quantum dialog. So r plus i epsilon, and then e to the minus 2 i x w dw, and then it's a 4 shinch hyper, I mean, hyperbolic. Wb, uh, sinh hyperbolic W divided by B, uh, and W. Like this. And then what is H bar in this picture? Well, H bar inverse is B plus B inverse squared. And that's actually minus 4CB squared, which we in this case here will require to be in R plus. And CB will be the choice that this is in I times positive reals. So it's R plus I epsilon to the really straight line, or it's something which goes. And also W is zero Which one? Sorry, what? Yeah, the, the this is straight line, a little bit above the real line. 
but does it just go as a semicircle about the or it just no, oh, just one the poles so the function here has the property that it has the poles up here and the first one is in CB so anything goes uh, above the real line okay but the combin this exact combination that I have in order to guarantee that this guy here lies in the Schwarz class of the real line you have to be a little bit above the axis to do this a little bit above the real axis all the way okay so that is the uh, this is that's this D, t q of t okay now what invariance properties does it satisfy well, of course, the first thing we have to worry about is what about the uh, 4T relation? No, not 4T relation, sorry. The 3, 2 move. Um, so, uh, yeah, 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, why do you need to belong to the Schwartz class? Because I'm applying uh, the weil galf sack transform to it, and I would like it to be regular on the circle. Because you multiply many things you don't want to have. Yeah. So if it, it could have been distributions, but if you, you know, distributions can only be multiplied if they have transverse wave functions. Uh, sorry, wave, wave front. what's it called? Wave, front. wave fronts. Now, the nice thing about, and that's what we really worried about in the Teich Miller TQFT formulation, these were distributional sections, or distributional functions. In this here, they are smooth functions along the integration cycle. So no problem. Okay, all right. So uh, let me remove this guy here. So, I mean, now you can go and compute this guy for anything you want. You just draw some graph in the plane of consisting of these uh, four valent vertices, right? And you, just, you take some direction on it, you check that they're all plus and minuses with ins and outs as I uh, ask you to. Now you check what are the variables available. You choose dihedral angles. You stick this in, boom, you do the integrations. That's it. Do you get the QFT like you assign something to two dimensional, one dimensional, zero dimensional? Yes, but I will only describe what you get for a not complement today in order not to make this lecture five hours long. Okay, but of course it's a TQFT. All right. But you see, the main question really is, first of all, of course, Pachner move, right? So is it invariant under the Pachner move? And the relevant one here is 3 to 2 in this dimension, right? We're in dimension 3, so it's 3 to 2. It's the boundary of the four-dimensional simplex to split into two parts. In dimension 4, it would be the 3-3 three, three move by splitting a five-dimensional simplex into its three and three four simplices. That was an aside. So uh, let me just try to draw this as quickly as I can. You can take two tetrahedra and glue them along a face like this, uh, these two faces, or you can make further demand on which goes sort of beyond my artistic abilities, I'm afraid, but uh, let me try someone. You take, uh, you take three orange peels like this, right? An orange with three, what do you call those? So this guy's behind, like that. And then you glue those three together. These are three tetrahedra that glue together to form the same shape as if you glue those two together. So that's the two, three move. And now what you do is you can very easily check. You know, you have angles on this side, you have angles on this side. There will be a transformation rule of the angles between the two. But new edge will be balanced, yeah? But new edge has to be balanced to get invariance. And so it turns out that we have invariance under this move 
only, well, I mean, that's, yeah, only if uh, middle, the middle edge edge is balanced. Okay. So you need to balance the middle edge. Okay. And that when once you do this, the five term relation that the quantum dialog satisfies. And if you want, I can just uh, write it up in operator form, if you like. So it satisfies the following. Namely, if you take phi b of p hat and compose with phi b of q hat, where p hat and q hat are the usual meanings, then this is the same as phi b of q hat, phi b of p hat plus q hat, phi b of p hat. So when you turn and you rework this, okay, into the language of integration kernels and so on, you will find that that's the relation exactly you need. So mm, the same as they did in your talk, <laughs> except that you forgot, yeah, so Q hat means multiplication by Q, and P hat means differentiation with respect to Q. What? Uh, no, it's normalized in this way. Okay. So, with all the sort of <laughs> exact formulations, you know, that's exactly this. Okay. All right, so. So the claim is that the five-term relation implies what you needed to get the... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Can, can B will be unitary operator or what? Uh, phi B of P, no. This is not unitary operator. It's self adjoint operator. Self adjoint operator. And non bounded, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So yeah. should refer to by such a bunch of to well, make real meaning of it, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I can rewrite all of this into a formula that just involves integration kernels. So, in fact, you know, this here, remember that this here will be an integration over two things, or four things, right? And this here will be integration over six variables. And so th that, so just write what it, if you want to know what it means is, take your definition, take our definition, do it on this side, take our definition, do it on this side, these two are equal. And integral will be convergent, no problem. And integrals are convergent because everything is on this compact cycle, right? Ah, uh, yeah. Right. No, but for this stuff, yeah. So we don't use this. It's just a fast way of writing out what it is instead of writing the long expression okay. products and blah, blah, blah. Right? So there is a for, I mean, uh, this can be translated and proved that as such as an integration, you know, because you, what you got, what are you going to do? You're only going to integrate over one variable. So this side here is products of three integration over one variable is equal to product of two. That's it. And so, so here it's integrate abstractly. It's integration of one guy, and then product of three things is equal to product of two things. And you're obliged to have it like this, right? Because you don't fix any of the rest of the variables. So they're sitting on the edges, and you're not integrating over them. So it's really a relation like this. Okay, good, very good. So, um, right. And so, there, but there is a little hiccup here. If you look at these equations, I don't want to write them out because I, I don't really have time, but I think you can easily do them, right? I mean, you see, for example, if I, this edge is glued to this edge, which becomes this edge over here. So the sum of the two dihedral angles here have to be this dihedral angle and so on around. And so there will be three, sorry, six equations and then there is the balancing in the middle. And the thing is that if you have assignment of uh, edges on this side, you can assign edges on this side and they will be positive. But the converse is not always true. And of course, provided you, you also want to balance on the interior edge that you're creating here, right? And so the converse is not always true. You cannot always necessarily find positive solutions of these equations when you want to eliminate these variables. And so that, in a sense, is a problem because so far, 
this statement, the fact that this function is in a Schwarz class function, requires that all the angles are positive. If the angles are no longer positive, it may not be Schwarz class. Okay, but so, there is the little following theorem uh, that maybe it's a good thing to write it over here. This guy here, A of X, so I try to make it here, X is meromorphic in A. So when I extend all the angles to be uh, complex, or there is a way to extend the, all of this, so to continue the definition, the whole idea is basically you just take this straight torus and you start deforming it when you make the variables complex. And this way you can prove that this is a meromorphic function of the A's. And once you have done that, there is no problem of letting all the angles be whatever they want, negative or complex or uh, whatever, and then this thing here becomes an identity of meromorphic functions. Okay. by A what? All the variables that this guy depends on afterwards, so the resulting angles, right? Okay. All right. So now, yeah. So so let's see how much time do I have? Remove balance stages. Yeah. Yes, that's the whole thing. Balancing has to stay. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's right. So they become invisible, right? Yeah. Uh, so only seven minutes. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Um, mm. Right, so, so, so let, let, me just, uh, let me just try to do it uh, somewhere here. Maybe I, I take this one here. So it... it So I still have too many variables because I have all these variables that are living in these tetrahedra, right? That are entering the game. And uh, yeah, so 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 basically, I mean, what I have to do is the following. So I look at a of x. And this is now all angles, which I now allow to be complex. And uh, they live on H1 of X twiddle. So X twiddle is just a disjoint union of all the tetrahedra. So I just write it like this. So that's before I glue. And then I take H1, but of course we know that the angles are, uh, you know, equal on opposite sides, so I just make a little equivalence relation here that identifies opposite edges on the tetrahedra. But this twiddle here does not mean gluing. So there are three. It's, in yeah. it's just in resolution, take opposite edge. And so now what I do is I say, and so I just uh, uh, put in the relation, so alpha zero one of t plus alpha zero two of t plus alpha zero three of t is equal to pi for all tetrahedra. So this is really the space of, uh, of angles that the whole thing depends on, right? Okay, and now, of course I have my glued guy. And so, so far it doesn't really depend on x, it only depends on, on this disjoint union of tetrahedra. No information is really needed to do this guy. But now comes the gluing information. I have a map from a of x over to delta 1 of x, which is just this map that sums the angles around each of the edges. Okay? So this is this little omega that I talked about before, but now I've, I've flink of it. I wrote omega for an edge, now it's the whole set of four edges. Okay, so so you know what this is, right? This is the sum of angles, sum of complex angles 
angles around edges in X. Okay. And so it actually turns out the following. There is, so I don't want to describe it, but there's a very beautiful Poisson structure on this space here, okay, which has to do with something, some signs and some stuff, okay. So it turns out actually there's a symplectic form on this space, a complex symplectic form. And so, um, what I, and so, there, but, but I just gonna say it this way. There is, so because there is a symplectic form here, and actually this here, they all, these all functions, all Poisson commute, then actually this space here will act on this space here by flow, by Hamiltonian flows. Okay, and those Hamiltonian flows preserve this function here. So there is an action of uh, C to the delta one of X on A of X. And I can write down explicitly this, but I don't have time to do it. So there is a explicit action on this, which uh, leaves uh, omega invariant, omega x invariant. And that means that I can consider the following set, omega x inverse of 2 pi to the delta 1 of x, right? I mean, 2 pi to repeat it that many times, divided by this action. And so this thing here very nicely has a topological interpretation, this quotient. So this thing here is nothing but the first cohomology of the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of the zero cells with complex coefficients. So there is a nice topological formula for what this is. So this is invariant of it, right? Because by the Pachner move, we don't change this. So this here is, a, and by the way, any two tetra triangulations with at least two tetrahedra can be related via Pachner moves of the same topological space. And so this quotient here is a topological gadget. And so I have a function defined on this, which is meromorphic by what I just wrote up here. And it turns out, of course, that this function is invariant under this flow here. I'm sorry, I cannot read. You are taking the inverse of what? 2 pi repeated delta 1 of x times. Ah, I balance all the edges. Just one point. Ah. Yeah, just, I balance all the edges. That's what I'm saying. Balance all the edges. And now it turns out there's an action of this that preserves this balancing space. And there is a very nice formula here for what that quotient space is. Okay. And so therefore, so the, the, the theorem is, that this gadget is invariant under this action. So this partition function here drops down to live on this quotient space. Okay, so actually, if twiddle H, so actually, I'm going to cheat a little bit, okay? There was a 12th root of unity that I cheated with here. I know the formula explicitly, okay? There is a little projective ambiguity when I do the Pachner 2-3 move. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's a very simple e to the, you know, some linear formula in the angles. So don't worry about it, okay? But um, so the point is that this guy here of X is a well-defined, well-defined well function on H1, the boundary of the tubular neighborhood of the zero simplices with complete coefficient. So of course, if... Uh, well-defined meromorphic function, thank you. Yes, on this space. And depending on h-bar is still a positive number? h-bar is still a positive number, so, but, but there is some discussion about how it extends and so on, but, but uh, I would like to avoid it right now. And so the, the, the thing is that there is also 
you know, so you can ask, well, there is a lattice inside here, right? Namely this one here. Okay, and so that of course acts, and so the quotient would be some torus. And it turns out that this guy here is this quasi-invariant. So, in other words, there is a construction of a line bundle over that space, H1 of the boundary of the tubular neighborhood of the zero cells with coefficients in complex numbers, divided by H1, boundary of n, delta of zero of x, integers. And it turns out that this guy here, there's a little slight renormalization of this guy, okay? And this renormalization I, I want to drop, okay? But this, but so you see, I dropped the, the little twiddle on it. This guy here becomes a meromorphic section of this. So this is a meromorphic section. Okay? All right. And so that guy, as a meromorphic section, is uh, an invariant of the three manifold. This, the only depend, this, this object here is an invariant, is an invariant of X. So that's our T of T invariant associated to, if you like, a closed space. Although I have these cusps, right? Now, there is two kind of vertices you do not touch yet. That exactly, those vertices. Uh, 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 so, uh, manifold is some. With some, you know, boundary. yeah, typically what you should think of is a torus boundary, but yeah. Non yeah, non empty, non empty, because, well, the whole thing works in general, but it's just that uh, the story is, is, is empty for Euler characteristic reasons, if this is a sphere. Okay, and so now I just want to end by showing you two theorems. Uh, well, one theorem, sorry, one no, theorem. Oh, by the way, even yeah. if it's spheres, then it is, this is just a point. Yeah. What is a normal function on a point? It's, it's, could be, it's no, no. Could be not defined, or, or what is it? No, I mean, it's, the, story is, no, the story is empty because oh, the set is empty. Why empty? No, it's just one point. No. So no, because you cannot balance. There is an Euler characteristic uh -huh, obstruction. You cannot balance. No. So there's completely empty. So it's a function defined on the empty set. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But so theorem. Suppose k is hyperbolic. So take a, a hyperbolic knot. Then, of course, you can triangulate the complement this way. And so then it says that there exists a j h bar k s of r some uh, not invariant so some function depending just on the topological type of k such that this invariant here of x this is of the following form e to the i pi over 4 h bar and then some phi x of the alphas, and then the weil gelfand sack transform applied to this function. And now evaluated on mu and lambda, and mu and lambda are the meridian and the longitude variables in this space. So it turns out actually that we started with the weil gelfand sack transform, and it did all of this, right? But at least for hyperbolic knots, we can prove by choosing a very nice triangulation that comes from hyperbolic geometry, that this section here is actually uh, the image of some specific J, actually the way we do it. <laughs> it's just we construct this, okay? Something for short space, but you have meromorphic functions from the continuation. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But here, the, the, this is described in terms of the real angles. This is the, the identity for the real positive angles. Which it has because it's hyperbolic. Yeah, but for example, this neural function should have poles somewhere. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. But it's outside the integration cycle. Do, do you have an idea of what are poles? There are poles. Yeah, yeah, we can say something about the poles and so on in some cases. Is but it, is it analytic in, in respect to h bar? Yes, yes. I mean, it, yes. It, it, on the complement of the negative real axis, it's uh, analytic. So. Um, 
So, so, so the point is that this whole complicated gadget turns out to be some function, okay, which isn't quite gauge invariant of the, uh, of the, of the angles because it is actually exactly of the appropriate type to be a section of the line bundle here times another section of another line bundle, which is this guy here. And so, uh, and then uh, just a conjecture here at the bottom, namely if you take the absolute value of this guy at zero, then this thing here should grow to like e to the minus two pi h bar, the volume of k. So it's a kind of anti-volume conjecture, because notice I said decay like the volume. Renat's conjecture for, for, for knots in his invariant is that it grows exponentially with the volume. Can, can you read the exponent? Yeah, minus two pi h bar volume of k. So if you take this function, evaluate it at zero, and you look at its behavior as h bar goes to infinity, it will grow, sorry, it will decay exponentially fast and it decays with the rate of the volume. That's the conjecture. And we can check this conjecture for k equals to 415261. The asymptotic is for h bar going to infinity. Yeah, yeah, sorry. h bar going to infinity. Uh, no, no, h bar going to zero. So you divide by infinity. Then it's one of h bar. You divide by h bar. Yeah, universe. Yeah, but I mean, I wrote it, I think, the way it is. Sorry, I mean, I, I got it wrong here. Like that. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Right. So, um, and if you like, uh, so I, I, I'll stop in, in a second. Uh, but uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I think I said that more than once now. But uh, I just want to write one example. And it's very dangerous to write it on this board. <laughs> Maybe I can clear it now. So, so we can compute this. So this, this J function, uh, which the J stands for Jones. So uh, this J function also appeared in a non-new form, so the original formulation. And, um, and there we conjectured there exists such a J, but the thing is that you can take this gadget here and then you restrict this thing to this torus and you take the inverse of the weil gelfand sack transform. And that defines the J for you because it's an isomorphism. And so J for one of X, this is integral over R minus I epsilon, and then phi B of X minus Y divided by phi B of Y e to the two pi I X uh, two Y minus X dy. And uh, uh, J52, just to give you a couple of examples, this guy here is um, uh, integral over R, and then uh, yeah, DW, and then it's E to the pi I W minus, okay, sorry, W and U. Two variables are integrating over uh, u, w plus u, phi b of w plus u, uh, phi b of w minus u, and then phi b of w. Uh, uh, let me let me just check this. It looks funny. Um, yeah, this is a single integral, and it is like this, and then this is u. Okay, so the explicit formulae in terms of integrations along some cycle that's R Rn, and then you have certain combinations of the day of quantum dialogues. It's a relation to the usual Jones. Okay. Very good question. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will. 
I will try to address this in the next lecture. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If you get function on C star to some power, yeah, you go to universal power on C. Is it just meromorphic function to say two two differential equations in in this case? Two different equations. Two, two different equations, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, but is it okay. new invariant or you can relate it to any other existing invariant? You don't know about Jones. Like so, I introduced the Jones function yesterday, which was the generating, or the Jones series, which was the generating series of all the colored Jones polynomials. Yeah. Okay. And my conjecture is there is some funky transform from that to. So remember, that was this space here, right? Uh, power series in T. And so I would like to see some kind of completion of this space being isomorphic to the Schwarz class of the real line in such a way, so by some isomorphism phi, in such a way that this Jones series of color Jones polynomials is taken to this J. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm. yeah, very naive question. If I consider this particular GFT on a three manifold with a single boundary, which is a Riemann surface with mark point, yeah. uh, will uh, this F be related to new deal conformal blocks? Or maybe, maybe, because you know we started with quantum Teichmüller theory, okay? But the thing is that we had to introduce the angles in order to regularize the whole thing, yeah. and the angles are not present in quantum Teichmüller theory. Basically, the angles are such that the tetrahedra are completely flat mm -hmm. in quantum Teichmüller theory, and so this process of gauging and introducing the angles, well. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, so it's not sort of str I mean, if you didn't gauge, if you didn't gauge with the angles, all of this would be, you know, undefined integrals. Yeah. Mm. Uh, okay. If you are still related to borrow and construction of um, topological recursion, um, maybe they, they applied some um, that platform to the topological recursion to construct um, Polynomial for the hyperbolic knot, I think. So is your theorem related to borrow any other um, paper? Not that I know of, but uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And that's it. Is there any relation to complexify chart assignments for SL2? That will be the subject of next hour's talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> Okay.